Welcome to episode 107 of the World Builders Anvil. And today's topic, Fallout 4, World Review. Woohoo! Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. All right. Once again, my name is Jeffrey W. Ingram, and I'm here today with... Not Michael Miller. Not Michael Miller. Hello, not. And <laughs> I'm Kristen Ingram, is, and, and I'm really excited because I wanted to do this show. She, she demanded this show as payment for her hard work during the last episode. As Michael is currently unavailable, he should be back next week for our episode. But she's very excited to do this one because, like me, she's a big Fallout fan. Now, the World Builders Anvil is a show where normally I talk about world building topics, but occasionally I talk about other worlds or I interview people, do other fun things that sort of involve world building. And so today we will be looking, of course, at Fallout 4's Earth. I think Bethesda in general does a really good job when it builds a world. Whether you're talking about the world using Skyrim or the alternative Earth Mm -hmm. from Fallout, because Especially with an alternative Earth, mm. it has to be, there has to be things that are identifiable. Yeah. And especially with Fallout 4 using something like Boston, mm-hmm. and I'm from Massachusetts, That's and right. I spent a lot of time in Boston, so to go around and be like, I know that place, I know that place, <laughs> but it's so different because, you know, the post-Fallout world. Yeah. It's like one of the things you notice right away in the Fallout worlds are technology is not small. And um, the cars are big still. Um, it's like the fifties never ended. And um, well, there. What was the the key technology that they never developed that we the did? Transistor. There you go. There Thank are you. no transistors, so they use vacuum tubes, which have actually been highlighted in some of the in the trailer. I believe for Fall Three had a big vacuum tube lighting up in it, and uh, that's the reason why. Um, and so there's definitely a deviation and. A, if I can find the video, I'll link it in the show notes. I'm not sure if I can, but there's an alternate history uh, timeline of of the changes between their Earth and ours. And obviously, once you deviate from that point, and I believe that's the first point is the transistor, uh, things radically change and hopefully will be completely different on this version. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> now, the year is 2287. Uh, which is a couple hundred years after the actual, uh, a little bit over 200 years since the actual war happened. Just just to say right out front, if you're wanting to play Fallout 4 and you want no spoilers, this is not a good episode. We're talking about the world, and to do that, we will be probably spoiling things. We won't be spoiling story, I don't think, but uh, certain things might actually spoil the story so uh, or spoil part of the fun for you. So if you've not yet got enough of it, or you've not yet tried it but plan to, uh, I would hold off and listen to this episode later. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Right off the bat, to give you an idea places, that's the thing I always start off when I world build or I come up with the idea of the places now. Uh, in certain ways, it's easier because uh, the solar system is predefined for you if you're going to do an alternate Earth. Uh, the stars are all there. And actually, the cultural impacts on the cultures on Earth are already there. So you have a baseline uh, to the point you deviate your timeline. And from that point, you have to start creating. And that's something um, that they did well. To notch it in, uh, first off, if if you care about the other uh, Fallout uh, games, there is an anthology that they have, which you can uh, get for PC and I believe uploaded in Steam. Um, and it comes with a nuke, a mini nuke. With, it comes with a big nuke. It's worth buying just for the nuke, if you ask me, or the mini nuke, really, with sound. And um, if you want more information on uh, the rest of the Fallout world that has been discovered so far, go to episode 65. There will be a link to it in the show notes at Garduel.com as well. And to give a basic idea, I'm a map geek, if you haven't noticed from listening to the show or if you've not. Uh, listen to any map episodes that have maps and cultures and the two are really linked 
So I actually uh, went on a map to try and figure out exactly area of Fallout. And some of it's obvious uh, when you play the game, because obviously the middle's Boston. And uh, Salem is in the game, which is quite obvious from one of the areas that you can uh, get a quest to pretty early. Uh, on the other side of the map, in the northwest corner, it, it goes a little bit beyond the town of Concord, which uh, you might remember from uh, your American history classes. That was uh, kind of where the revolution uh, ended up starting. And Lexington is obviously involved as well, too. The shot heard around the world was Lexington Concord. Yes. And then they went, uh, it was Lexington first, I, I think mm-hmm. the British ship first, and then Concord. And then further south, there's a town called Sherborne. And you wouldn't notice this in game. I really had to kind of try and guess based off the other points I know. Um, there's a part of the world they call the Glowing Sea because a whole bunch of giant nukes went off there. And it's a highly radioactive part of the world. There's not much left there. But it appears to be around this town called Sherborne. And I'm probably mispronouncing all of these because I don't speak with a Boston accent. And I'm trying to use the letters I see. And then, of course, uh, the southeast corner is Quincy, um, the lovely town of Quincy. It's essentially, it's the I-95 corridor, if you're familiar with the Boston area. All things pretty much inside of I-95 and some things uh, on the edges of where 95 used to be. So if you really think about, like, land-wise, this map is not huge compared to, like, the map you had for D.C. or... Mm -hmm. Um, which was Fallout 3, the the Boston, you know, even when you walk it, it doesn't, it's not that huge. I'm hoping some of the expansions, you know, I'd love to be able to go like up into New Hampshire I'm and kind of see what's going the on cape. up there. They have to do the Cape. Yeah, see what's going on um, at the Cape just because, you know, the only way to get to Cape Cod is through bridges. And if mm-hmm. the bridges are gone, like, how do you do that? But I think it'd be pretty interesting with the the freedom streak that they have up in New Hampshire. To see what New Hampshire is. I, wa- I want to see what New Hampshire looks like. I really do. Well, maybe the Free State Project finally took over. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's one of the extra things. And the other interesting thing I noticed is this will be the only chance you'll have in your life to probably use the Mass Turnpike and the old 93 without paying tolls. Mm. So it's like a bonus, like, they don't even list that as like a, a value proposition for the game, but I found it exciting walking up the Mass Turnpike into, <laughs> into the tunnels in Boston. Yeah, that's true, because you can actually go in the Mass Pike tunnels, mm-hmm. so that's pretty... I didn't even think of it that way. And the trains are, uh, still work as well as they did, did last winter in Boston, yeah. so, um, uh, which they obviously had a very rough winter for people if they don't know. But uh, yeah, so that's essentially where we're located at on Earth. It's essentially the I-95 corridor, if you go look at a map. Um, that's kind of where the game covers. And the interesting thing is actually when I was checking out the real-world map of Boston, uh, just north of where they have West Concord and Google Maps, there's a lake with an island on it, which will be the vault that you start in in the game, and you emerge from that point. So it's essentially West Concord uh, is where you're starting the uh, game at. That's interesting. Yes, because I'm a map geek. I, I wondered if there was actually a lake with an island right around there. And there is. There's an interesting post. Um, it might have been on IGN where a woman actually put together like points from the game mm-hmm. um, as a birthday present for her boyfriend. Oh, so they went and visited some of the, the key spots? Yeah, and they actually went to the spot where they thought if the you, opening vault was. If you've ever been to Boston, uh, one of the most iconic landmarks in the game is Fenway. And I think that is so fitting uh, because Fenway is an iconic site of the town in a non historical way. But really, uh, baseball is very important in Boston and the Sox are important, uh, even when they're frustrating people and not winning. But uh, when they're winning, um, uh, what they did with Fenway, I thought was very, uh, very appropriate. And it makes me happy to know. It, it makes me happy to know as a Sox fan that Fenway Park survived to 2077. Because that's actually a really big movement out here. Every time they talk about trying to build a new stadium, um, the fans go crazy. Yeah. 
because Fenway is so iconic. So they just kind of keep expanding the existing park. And now with the old Yankee Stadium left, there aren't too many of the old ballparks left. Um, and to me, that was a sad one, too. I know you probably uh, wish they didn't rebuild a Yankee Stadium, but um, the old parks have a heart to them. Um, they're not comfortable seats. They're not big seats. But there's a heart when you go to a place like Fenway or the old Yankee Stadium or, or Wrigley Field that you just don't get in the, the new stadiums with the nice seats. It's just not the same kind of feel to the game. Um, so I was really happy with that, though. That and there's cool. nothing like being surrounded by drunk guys in um, Fenway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was kind of sad Foxborough did not make it. So there's, um, But maybe the game developers hate the Patriots, and that's the center of the glowing seas. Really not on this map. It's actually uh, Foxborough. It's actually game. Foxborough. Uh, it might be uh, depending on uh, how how much they just like the Patriots. That's true. <laughs> okay, so the next thing I, I would like to talk about are factions. Um, there are four major factions in the game: the Minutemen, aptly named obviously because of the Minutemen the area. You know, the shot her around the world were the Minutemen and fighting the British. And essentially, there's this militia and. Um, the idea of the militia, uh, supposedly, and whether or not it changes at some point, I've not yet finished the story of the game, so I don't know, but uh appears to be they just want to sort of protect what they call the Commonwealth. And and so they will react to different areas of the map. They will come help you if you're allied with them. Um, but uh their goal is to try and protect the communities of the Commonwealth from uh aggressors either other factions or aggressors who are um, uh, just uh, normal bad guys like your raiders and super mutants, those kind of uh, groups out there which just want to eat you. Well, and, and, you know, that just reminded me. I don't think I've ever, I've ever seen them call it Massachusetts. No, because it's the con- it doesn't exist anymore. Does not exist in the alternate Earth. Uh, they actually got rid of most of the states, and essentially the Northeast is called the Commonwealth. Right. But I thought that that was kind of interesting because, you know, in previous games they talked about, you know, they talked about California. Mm. Um, you know, of course, D.C. was still, you know, considered an area, um, but New England became the Commonwealth. Yes, and possibly a little bit more. I don't know the exact borders there, but uh, yeah, it was the Commonwealth. and. Um, then you have a group called, uh, we'll, we'll jump to the Institute. Uh, this is a vague reference to, in the real world, what you would call MIT. However, I believe it's called the Cambridge Institute of Technology in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it's exactly in the same spot. And uh, they were big technology guys, which is what MIT is. So essentially it is uh, the Cambridge Institute of Technology. They have their own. Is little, it the Commonwealth Institute thought, of Technology? I thought it was Cambridge, but it could be the Commonwealth. I just know CIT. It's CIT. I, um, and it's in Cambridge, right across the river from Boston. And it's interesting because the institute was actually a reference from Fallout Three. Yes, they had talked about the institute up in yes, Boston. Two of these factions were talked about, and actually, there was a one quest involving. Uh, two of the factions from this game that haven't been in any other game except for one quest in Fallout 3. And uh, the Institute being one of those, uh, they build these things called synths, uh, which at the high end are sort of like human replacement devices. And they love science for the sake of science. And um, one of the things I like about Fallout is they never try and moralize the groups there's obviously the factions you're supposed to be against but the thing is there are there are pros and cons you know to every group in these games uh, no matter what your political belief is uh there are things that you might like or dislike about all of them because well i like this but i don't like that and uh this too is definitely one of those uh this is one that you're you probably will align against when you play the game, but you don't have to because you can end up being part of the Institute. Well, and I think they do. When you first start playing the game, especially when you go to Fenway, everyone's afraid of the Institute. Yeah. Everyone's afraid of the synths. People, mm-hmm. 
you know, there were vendors in the game that like, you're not a synth, are you? Right. You're not, right? Yes. That's the thing is <laughs> characters moralize pro and against factions, but the game itself kind of leaves it up to the player to choose which faction is the most appropriate. Right. So, but when I started playing, I was like, wow, these synths, you know, nobody seems to like them and okay. And then, and then you meet the next faction, mm -hmm. which is the railroad. Yeah. And you start to think differently about them. Well, and also too, and uh, when you make it into the Institute, you might start thinking differently about the Institute. And I definitely don't want to spoil anything there, mm. but uh, as part of the main story, you will go into the Institute and it might change your mind on what you're thinking. Um, faction wise. Now, the Railroad are a group that do not like the Institute at all. They really don't like anyone. Um, and they're based on the Underground Railroad. The, the old Underground Railroad, which was also very big in Massachusetts uh, as part of the way for slaves to escape from the South. And this is ironically kind of going the other direction where they're trying to get uh, uh, synthetic beings out of the Institute uh I guess down south or anywhere else to be free and live free lives. Uh, now, it, it, it's an interesting concept. I, I, I like the railroad. The, the, there's good and bad things about all these factions. So, um, the w one misfortune is it becomes quite apparent as you're playing the game and from a pretty early standpoint that there will be conflict between these factions. I, I do not believe there's a peaceful way to end without, uh, a uh, faction war in this game, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, I like to have options to do whatever I want to. Um, and, and uh, this game did feel a little bit more restrictive than other ones. You feel like you're making choices, but you're not really, you're, you're really changing the tone of your voice when you respond to people. But the railroads, an interesting concept, the idea of freeing these people. Um, and then, but once again, trust me, whenever you get involved in these factions, you start learning that, there's more to it from their angle. And so there's no clear side that you could take uh, in this game where you're, you're not, you're probably going to have some part of you go, I don't like this part of them. Yeah. I, I've had that with all the factions. So you're kind of like, all right, these guys are awesome. And they're like, Oh mm, no, yeah. mm, mm, no, I don't like that. Well, I was very excited when the last faction, uh, appeared in the game, and you can get to them relatively quickly. Uh, there's a quest involving them from the beginning of the game, pretty much. And um, it's the Brotherhood of Steel. And I really like what they did with the Brotherhood of Steel in DC. Uh, it, it created a huge variant between the West Coast Brotherhood of Steel, which is very much secretive, hidden underground, stealing technology by force. And, and they humanized them a lot and made them really sort of care about the area. Well, in the 10 years since the ending of Fallout 3, it appears that uh, there's a new leadership in uh, D.C. And uh, they are a much more aggressive, much more similar to the original Brotherhood of Steel. Um, good or bad, that's the way they are. A lot of people like them because if you've seen pictures of the game with big brooding guys with big weapons and big power armor, these are probably the people you're seeing pictures of. But, yeah, I... You learn very early on that the Brotherhood is really about the Brotherhood. Yes. And that's, which is funny because that is so opposite of the Minutemen, who are the Minutemen are like, we just want everybody to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to make sure that this is a safe place to be. Yes. Um, And it's, so it's kind of interesting when you have the Brotherhood who have all this technology. Yes. And they just kind of want to hoard it to protect themselves. Most and you've got definitely. the Minutemen who are like, you know, scraping together whatever they can yes. to keep the Commonwealth safe. Making their laser muskets. Come on, guys. You know, I, I think, you know, I think so far, um, I like the Minutemen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more of like a moral judgment on my part that like, mm -hmm. you know, they want to help everybody. And yeah. And the thing I like is you seem to be able to to go the way you want to. And sometimes you want to go away, but then something like, eh. and you want to go another way, like, eh. and uh, trust me, they, they put hooks in to make any choice you make difficult, which is one of the uh, cool things around the faction system here is, and it's the game master in me. I love to torture players uh, emotionally and physically um, whenever they play games with me. And so that, 
oh, as a player, I like that as well too. I I don't like it to be easy like aha, this is a clear an easy choice that these guys are the vile evil bad guys, um, or these are the vile good 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 guys. Even though I've never really heard the term vile good guys before, but hey, whatever we make up things here. But I think they do a really good job making all four of the factions compelling. Yeah. And where you probably won't find any of them perfect, you'll probably find one that you like the most. And uh, and and those four you can play through. There are some smaller factions. The main one I'm thinking of right now um, uh, is the Ch- Children of the Atom, uh, which is this weird cult. Uh, they were in Fallout 3 also. They were also in Fallout 3. I don't remember if they were in the other games or not um but they're interesting uh there is uh diamond city good neighbor and those are sort of their own little faction groups there uh so the, the, there's some smaller factions too but these are the big factions of the game well and i, and I would kind of argue too that if you go into the world building aspect of it you can almost build your own faction because you're recruiting people you're bringing them in you know, yes, but you're doing that through the auspice of the Minutemen. Okay. Or you can, in theory, do it at least through the Brotherhood of Steel as well, too, I believe. But it's a little different in the interactions. Um, uh, places we kind of cover this. So I won't spend a lot of time here. Um, but essentially, like I said, it's the I-95 corridor. What are the few things that stick out in your mind from playing the game, like 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 location wise? Um, the USS Constitution was fantastic. Um, yes, you must go to Charlestown in this game. And find the USS Constitution. For me, that was really cool because I've been on a harbor cruise. Um, and it was like a, it was a celebration of the USS Constitution mm. and it was all lit up and everything. So to be able were to. Were you on the USS Constitution? I was not on the USS cruise? Constitution. Oh, I was, was on, up. yeah, we were on a boat that was like circling it. Because in real life, if I remember correctly, that's the one that does set off at Charlestown, right? It, it, so it was it was really neat to see that. You know, Fenway I thought was fantastic. Um, Quincy Market and Bunker Hill. <laughs> um, I well, when you live in Boston, there is there's actually a Bunker Hill Day, um, and it is it's a holiday that's similar. There's there's Veterans Day, which the entire country celebrates. Mm-hmm. Then there's Patriots Day, which is a Massachusetts holiday. Mm-hmm. And then a couple weeks after that, there's another holiday that's called Bunker Hill Day. <laughs> and it's only the Boston area that celebrates that holiday. Yeah. Um, so going up to Bunker Hill, you know, was that was fun. It made all those extra days off worth it for you huh? exactly yes in massachusetts we just really like holidays and and the, the real question is how many people in, in boston really understand what bunker hill day is uh is a different question for a different show well, it's uh, kind of like patriots day most people are like that's football day no no it's not football day <laughs> no we have a skewed view in yeah. massachusetts you know uh yeah for me it, um i have to say uh just uh, North End. I love the North End of Boston. Um, I am very sad there aren't more Italian restaurants in the game. <laughs> um, I'm hoping there's a way I can settlement build an Italian restaurant on the North End. Because if you go to Boston and you're on the North End, uh, go to the Italian food restaurants. You will not be disappointed. I think per capita or maybe for a large city, like the street has more Italian restaurants than any other city. It's one of the the claims when you're on the tours, whether or not it's true, I don't know, but it's Hanover Street yes, in the North End. Hanover Street, and uh, it, it is a great place to visit. But you know, just that that whole North End area, it's it's just where I like to go when I'm in Boston. Daniel Hall, not quite right, but you know, they also put Walden's Pond in the wrong spot, so I won't really. <laughs> um, I haven't been to Walden Pond yet. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's not southeast. Because the real Walden Pond is east of Concord, and this is like south of Concord, uh, what they call Walden, Walden Pond, uh, which is fine. Uh, it's an alternate world, so maybe the Waldens lived on a different pond. Um, but, uh. It wasn't the Waldens, it was one Walden. I know. <laughs> well, and Thoreau. 
Uh, isn't that where he hung out until he got arrested, I believe? Yes, that's where Thoreau hung out until he got arrested. So a lot of neat iconic spots, especially if you're familiar with the area. Uh, historically, there are some cool stuff like the Freedom Trail, which actually exists not in the same form as in the game. Uh, and you can, you know, it's one of the neat things to do in Boston. Uh, there are no duck boats that I can steal and utilize in the game. That was disappointing. Which is disappointing. But hey, you know, uh, I guess you have to have limits to have vertebrate instead of duck boats. I would have called the duck boats, but hey, that's me. Well, and you know, one thing that, and I don't know if they tried to do this and maybe companies weren't willing to, you know, to, to buy in, but, So, like, for example, like, there's, like, the Boston Brewery, Mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, that's Samuel Adams. Yeah, why don't we just call it Sam Adams? You know, um, Diamond City, they never refer to it as Fenway, but you know it's Fenway because... You know, the explanation of the way baseball's played when you go there is very cool. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so, but that's the thing. So, it's like, I wish that for some things that were really iconic... Mm -hmm. Um... You know, I, I haven't been able to find Newberry Street, which is yeah. a very iconic street um, in Boston. Is that sort of in the back bay? Where is Newberry Street in Boston? Um, Newberry Street is not far from Fenway. Okay. Um, it's it's probably three or four long city blocks okay. um, down Commonwealth Avenue. But so, if you were... S- but that's that's on uh, oh, what's that street? Uh, Boylston Street. And Boylston Street is important in the game, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, some of the other streets kind of disappear. And Newberry, you'd think, would be one that would make it because uh, you, you don't need. I can see why the issues with like Sam Adams and Fenway because you start getting to licensing problems there and stuff like that. But you know, that was one iconic street. I think that should should be in there. And even like um, Boston Common doesn't feel right to me. It's very small. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And you don't have the station on both ends of it. Like, cause do, can you actually take rides? Because I've never actually been into the the old subway there. Because this was the original subway in Boston, and it's I think it's just a tourist trap thing. No, no, was, you can actually get the on tea? the subway there. Okay. It's part of the T. Yeah, there's a no, there's actually Boston Common stops at each end of Boston Common because mm-hmm. it's so big. And that's why when I like when I got there and it was like Boston Common, I'm like, no, it's like a is, little square. Yeah. yeah, it's like a little patch of grass. Like, you know, like that doesn't yeah, work. It's like iconically, it's like that one didn't look quite right. Um, uh, uh, Daniel Hall did not look quite right. Um, but you know, they they the flavor came through with Daniel Hall of what they were trying to do there. Uh, Boston Common, kind of like you, should have been a bit bigger, but hey, um, you know, they have a resource thing that they have to worry about too. So. But yeah, there's a lot of neat places there to explore. That's one. Well, actually, one of the flaws of the game is there's so many neat places to explore. They have a map you can look at, and inside the map, little icons will pop up whenever you've discovered something that is discoverable that you can then use later on to travel back to it quickly. Or if you hear about it, have not been to it, it'll show up on your map, but uh, uh, to help you find it. But uh, it, it uh, you can't fast travel until you've been there once. And especially when you start getting up into the Back Bay, North End area. And um, I'm not sure what the the road is that goes south from there. Because I know it's Boylston Street towards uh, uh, towards Boston proper. But I forget the North-South Street there, like American Boulevard or something weird. Like Continental Boulevard or whatever that road is in real life. And when you travel down there, there's a little bit of stuff too. Uh, when you get away from that part of Boston, it starts to thin out a bit. But, um, but, you know, especially if, like you're, if you're zoomed down on your map, it's like you just see like these, you know, one massive icon over the, the north and uh, back bay areas of Boston. So, well, and, you know, again, I think scale wise, like there are some really big buildings that you can go into, like on the outside, they look humongous. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you get on the inside, they're not as big as you would think they should be or they do certain weird things like um like uh there are obviously some buildings that exist there that don't exist in, in boston for real and uh, which is fine too because it's an alternate world it's in the future um but it's like you know say like i was in the skyscraper and and you know they'll try and do things like oh wait, this elevator is not there and or it's broken so you can't really go down but this elevator will go up and 
So they do some weird things like that, but you know, whatever. They have to, you know, you know, they can't really create every square foot of of it, you know. So I well, usually look more for the feel of it. But the way that I kind of look at it is like if you look at Skyrim, right? Like the dwarven <laughs> ruins are I mean, there are some of them that take you yeah. hours to go through. Yeah. And so I was kind of thinking, all right, you're in a major city, you've got these huge skyscrapers. Like I figured that there would be you know, kind of the equivalent of dwarven ruins, where for if you really want to case this entire building, it's going to take yeah. you hours and to do. And they a way to make you know you can't by blocking an elevator or a staircase, and you can only go up so many floors. And that annoys me a little bit. I have to say. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. There's definitely no interiors that are the size of like the dwarven ruins. I mean, in Skyrim, not even close. So, um, yeah, that's definitely true because. I don't think I've ever spent more than probably 45 minutes in a specific ruin. Maybe a little bit longer because for you, because you loot everything, unlike me, where I just kind of fly through stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's why you liked my little trick when I told you to. Um, yes. So if you go into your menu in Fallout 4 and you, you go to your junk, mm -hmm. um, you can hit components you can hit you can go to components mm -hmm. and then you can tag all of your components if you're a ninja looter tag all of the components as something you're searching for mm -hmm. and then if you have what perk is it i can't remember i believe it's scrapper that causes it. scrapper level two yeah it will make everything you're looking for glow which what? means basically everywhere there's loot unless it's like caps or yeah. um or bobby pins, yeah. you know, or medical stuff, everything will glow. Pretty much. So if you're like a ninja looter, it's great. One thing I found that will not glow with junk inside of it are turrets that you blow up. Okay. Um, but whatever. Um, but it does really make your life easier if you're someone like Kristen who ninja boots. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Uh -huh. High kettle. <laughs> now, races very similar to Fallout. Uh, you have humans, ghouls, and super mutants. They added, I would argue, a new race called the Synths as well. Um, and some of the robots are approximating a race at this point, too. So you could maybe even argue the robots, which aren't quite the same thing as Synths. And you know that because Synths try and sort of look like humans and robots do not. Um, but um, But that's really all you have for races. There's nothing... Ghouls, I don't think, die. Um, super mutants don't really think. Um, <laughs> super mutants are hilarious, and they, they've done they a really good hilarious. job still making them hilarious. And uh, one of the great benefits uh, as you're playing the game is if you get a scrap of paper that says Super Mutant Orders, you must read it. Those are funny. And um, Well, and even with ghouls, too, you've got, you know, you've got ghouls that look you know, pretty yucky, but mm -hmm. they still have all their faculties. And then you have like yeah. the feral ghouls. And I don't consider those part of the ghoul race, um, even though they, they're they definitely, an, I guess you'd say, an extension of, because uh, essentially ghouls are just horribly irradiated humans that look like zombies. And feral ghouls are the ones that act like zombies. And so stay away from feral ones. Uh, it's your choice. You know, you could make the moral decision. I don't kill ghouls but you know hey if you want to play your game that way it's make believe and and i was really happy that they got rid of the i don't remember what they were called but they were like the short little guys that used to hang out with the super mutants and they had like all the legs and they would like scoot around on the floor oh they're yeah the senators they uh i haven't seen any of those i've yet. not seen those they've replaced them with mutant hounds now yeah which are cooler um, and they act off the same mechanic as one of your companions, the, do the dog does. Okay. And even the synths, though, they have the two, like, there are the synth soldiers, which don't really, they're not really they, thinking they beings. First, there are three gens of synths, I believe. And the third gen are the ones that are like humans, and the first ones are sort of like Terminators. Those are yeah. what they look like to me. Um, so, those are kind of like their pets, I guess. Yeah. Um, now, why why the world works. And this is obviously an opinion-based thing. If you disagree, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> Dictator Jeffrey. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. 
Uh, first, it's a very merciful world. And, and I'll say this as, as it's a good thing and it's as a warning. Especially if you're a world builder, they have the ability to build settlements. And connect them and create trade routes yeah. and, you know, protect them. and Or like if you're like me, okay, you need a person that uh, runs a mortar so you can have proper artillery coverage wherever you're at in the map. And yeah, yeah, you can spend a lot of time in just that part of the game. Um, the one limitation being building materials. Uh, however, if you can make money, uh, you can get building materials. Or if you loot everything, you can get building materials. Or if you're like me, you can do both. Uh, because I build a lot. Um, I could build a lot more. I have some flaws with it in the game where lining stuff up is kind of a pain and doesn't always work. And and the size limits are weird. The size limits are weird. And, and you know, it's like you get in this community, it's like Bunker Hills, like... A settlement community. So once you get it, you can actually start building in stuff there. But, you know, it, like if you don't go through and destroy everything you can, there's like 12 things you can build or something. It's a relatively small size limit. And which is in a way fair because there's a lot already pre built there, which looks better than what you can build because uh, there's no weird bugs with it. But uh, the screwed up thing is. Uh, it's like getting things to line up correctly. Even if they do, they don't always look like they're lined up correctly. Like in some of the buildings I've built, uh, you can like, when you're on the first floor, you can see out, uh, through like a hole in the ceiling and you're like, um, why is it not actually touching the wall? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't like the fact that you can't really repair the buildings that are there. Yes. Yeah, so and that's always, that's a of, flaw. That's always been one of the, our flaws in the game or why don't people try and make things nicer? And um and, and there's no way to do it. Like the first settlement you get is called Sanctuary Hills. And this is essentially, you know, just south of the vault you start in around West Concord. And um the problem with Sanctuary Hills is there's a bunch of homes. They're still relatively intact, but they're massively damaged. So one of the first things I wanted to do was repair the roof. And I I I can't figure out how to do it. Now I'm sure if you're on a PC version, you could probably use the console or or, or certain kinds of mods to try and uh, line up the walls uh, with the actual roof to do that. But it, it just doesn't let you do it naturally. Which to me, it's like well, let me at least repair it, even if you're not going to let me make it look nice, which kind of annoys me. At least let me patch the roof there, so I don't have to like. So I I I don't I have to sleep with a big hole over my head. Mm -hmm. Or even like you know like you have glass you can do things with glass, but you can't repair the windows. You know the one thing I do like, out. especially because of the size limit, is physics don't exist super good in the realm of building. So it's like, uh, I I have a wall built around Sanctuary Hills, and then uh, near the one entrance, I essentially built up a house, and then. The second floor, I just have a walkway that goes over top of the entrance, and I have, like, guns sitting all over it. But, you know, it's several hundred yards long, and there's nothing really underneath it. There's, like, a ladder on one side and a house on the other side, and just this strange thing with turrets sitting on it that floats over the door. There's no need for legs or, yeah. you know, any sort of supports. But th that would annoy me more if I needed to be because of the size limit. Mm -hmm. And since I can't line things up perfectly which annoys me. Um, I'd rather not even make it look like I was trying. Okay. Uh, and so the uh, other thing is there's a good mixture of drama and humor in Fallout. And this is for everything. Bethesda's done from Fallout 3 on, even though technically Obsidian uh, delivered Fallout New Vegas, uh, but it was licensed through Bethesda. And then before that... Um, uh, it, I can't remember who. Wow, my brain is frying there. Uh, it was made by someone else. <laughs> and if you go back to episode sixty-five, you can find out exactly who that is. Um, and they're actually making games again. They're actually making games again. They were a huge gaming company, and uh, they went out of business. That's how Bethesda ended up with the rights to this, and now uh, they're they're sort of back on their own making games again. And those games are a little bit different. They're sort of turn-based, uh, sort of based on a, a GURPS role-playing system, not exactly, and definitely not from a licensing standpoint, but 
um, the idea of tactical movements and stuff like that. But uh, all all of the games have had a great mix of drama and humor. And anything if you've ever studied storytelling or or play productions, if you want drama to matter, you need humor. You know, and the more dramatic you want something, the more important humor becomes because people will become numb to you know painful moments if they're one after another and it just will just seem to add on but if you can build up some dramatic tension and then you cut it back with humor it allows people to relax a little bit so the next bit of drama can make it more dramatic or vice versa you can use drama to uh make a slapstick comedy uh st- stretch out the humor a bit more in it well you know like like smallville was really good at that yeah like you would have like some really lighthearted episodes, then you have one that was pretty goofy, and you're like, "Oh, next Uh-oh. episode, we're so screwed, <laughs> so screwed." Yes, and they wouldn't always deliver, but usually. And and the other thing that really works for me in the Fallout worlds is tough choices. Um, usually, in all the games I played, making choice A causes more than one consequence and all of them are not always good even if what you're doing is for what you consider the greater good and you might not you might even believe it's for the greater good but there are other consequences you'll never appreciate that go along with it and that's very much like life so i like tough choices well and and i think it makes a game much more interesting you know when i think it was like sukaden like your favorite character was killed in sukaden and <laughs> you gotta bring that up. I'm sorry. Um, but like it makes the game compelling. Like it makes you want to play games in the series. Mm. Which and I do think it's cool that you can get Sukaden on the PlayStation Network now. Yes. And you can play all those old games that you can't get anywhere. <laughs> they don't make them like that anymore. They make no. them for a reason, but I I always preferred those kind of games for on for console role playing games. I, most of the real time ones I never really enjoyed, except for Fallout and Skyrim. But even those, it's like with the, you know, with it's less, Fallout less with the VAT playing. system. Yeah. You know, it feels like the combat can it, be turn based if you wanted to. Captures that feeling, especially with the old Fallout games were turn based. Um, so it it sort of recaptures it for that moment, and uh, I think the thing that works for me is it's open world. I love exploring. I love finding stuff. Uh, which is why I like those two games so much. But most uh, real-time role-playing games I've played don't really like that well. And I have to say the problem is, and you see this in even the Fallout and Skyrim games, the depth of role-playing is less when it's like when it's when it's not turn-based. Mm-hmm. I agree, but I I really think though that out of you know out of the role-playing you know, game genre, you know, I guess the games in that genre out of all the games we've played. I think that Bethesda does it best. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there are very few other since Sukaden. Yeah. That I've been like, yeah, like Dragon Age was okay. You know, um, oh, what was the, the humorous one? With the devils and oh, the, I don't, I know which one you're talking about. But I don't remember yet. I'll have to look. It was dark something. Those games were amusing. very amusing. Um, but yeah, there's not, there aren't a ton of games out there that you're like, wow, the story is really compelling. Mm-hmm. I like how I can affect the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are. If you don't have any, please let us know. And don't say Witcher. I'm sorry. Where there's great potential to that game, it's just not my style of game. Okay, you know, is there anything else for you that really that makes you think that that especially in Fallout Four that makes it the world work for you? Um, you know, I think it's when they created the world, it is different enough from our version of Earth. Um, that. You know, there are times you're like, you kind of forget that you're in Boston and then you see something that's iconically Boston mm. and you go, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so they did a really good job saying this is our version of Boston. Mm. This is what we believe it to be. Um, you know, one thing that, that didn't 
work for me was that I sometimes feel like the technology is at odds. Um, like we were talking about the fact they never developed a transistor, so they never had flat screen TVs, you know, they never had like the thing, you know, they still have like the old style, you know, think back to like the Macs that you used in school mm. when you were a kid. Um, they but yet had Macs when I was in school. But I'm yeah. sorry. Well, that's cause you're ancient. <laughs> um, you know, but the old like boxy, you know, computers that were like the one piece and then they have synths. Mm-hmm. And you're just like key, like that. I, my brain has a really hard time going from the big cars and you know the big the big tube style TVs and the big computers. Mm-hmm. And even like when you look at, you know, when you go into a lot of the buildings and the the computer systems that they're using they're are mass. humongous. Yep. They're massive. Um, and then you're like, and I'm going to go shoot since next to the big, huge computer, sure. you know, but here's the one thing to think about though. Have you seen anyone besides the Institute to have that style of technology? No. Who's to say they don't have transistors? Well, that's true. And they could have that technology. Mm-hmm. And that would play up to sort of the heart of their faction, which is science. Yeah. No, I just and it just. I get what you're saying completely, and there are other examples outside of sense where you're like, no, you know, like they have like these incredible like laser weapons, and Mm -hmm. you know, and even outside of the institute, you know, there are laser weapons, and you're like, you can't build a transistor, but you figured out laser weapons. They can have a laser pistol, you know, laser turrets, really, Mm -hmm. like that kind, like stuff like that kind of Mm -hmm. makes me like, that doesn't make sense. But overall, I think, you know, I think the majority of it works. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Okay. And now for the world-building task of the day. Take a faction of yours and upgrade it. And the idea there is, essentially, you have multiple factions in your world. Or you should. Or you should. And think about what is their interaction against each other. Because that's one of the big themes of Fallout 4. So it's a good thing to think about in your world are, you know, if I have this under, you know, this organized crime group in a town and law enforcement, what is their interaction versus each other? Especially when factions collide, it's a, it's a good way to find story ideas and it's a, a good way to add flavor into other stories because maybe uh, you're doing a story in a city and it's not really involving uh, organized crime directly or the law enforcement, but your character in their travels basically sees some of that stuff. So it, it, it's a way to flesh out a world is to understand how the different groups within it will interact. Right. And, you know, if you don't have factions, think at, you know, think about really compelling stories. You know, Lord of the Rings had a ton of different factions oh, yes. and some, and they had to work together even though they didn't like each other. Mm-hmm. Um, the TV show Lost mm-hmm. had a bunch of different factions. You know, factions bring richness to your world and to your stories. And a good way to think about it too, and Lost is a good one if you've seen it because the misconception always is the people who are against, they're all together. They're all working on the same page to bring us down. And when you start getting into the other side of the island and the people who are already there and lost, you start to realize that, wait, no, they're not this homogeneous directed group trying to defeat us. Uh, maybe they're trying to defeat us, but um, in, internally they have their own struggles because there always is. Um, if you have more than one person involved in a group, which by definition you'd have to, unless it's like, I guess, Eve or something like that, um, you have more than one reason for doing it. And if you want a current show that does factions really well, watch Blacklist. Yes. Blacklist is excellent at screwing with factions. Yes. And when you're watching it too, you're not even sure at this point, you know, I believe it's season three. I'm not sure how many factions there really are yet. Yeah. Yeah. But that's cool though. Yes. But it, they give the story incredible depth. Mm-hmm. 
So check, you know, check out Blacklist. I know it's on, I think it's on Netflix, the first two seasons, and then you can catch up, you know, you can catch up live. But it's, it's a really good show for factions. Yeah, most definitely. And now for the real world task of the day, play Fallout 4. There's a tough one. (laughs) Um, Wow, that was, that was easy. (laughs) And if you're if you're interested in Fallout 4, um, the Bethesda games usually come out with a lot of expansions. Mm-hmm. There's actually something you can get for Fallout 4 that's called the Season Pass. Mm-hmm. And it's 30 bucks, and it allows you to get all of the expansions when they come out for free. Yeah. And so I know we both we we have two copies of Fallout for two different game systems, so we don't have to fight over it. And we both bought season passes because we know their expansions are gonna be awesome. And one of the things to keep in mind there, too, is uh, it's only on, on current-gen uh, systems, so Xbox One, PS4, or PC. It would have to be a relatively newer PC, uh, uh, graphics-wise. Uh, um, so uh, if you were going to buy any of those, where would you go, Kristen? Go. To Amazon. <laughs> and I would access Amazon through Garduel.com slash Amazon. <laughs> Very good. Okay. And now the tease. The tease, this is uh, uh, one of Mike's, which he'll be back for, hopefully. And it's called... Michael. Who? Michael. Who's that? He's your co-host. Mike? (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying. Michael, if you're listening to this episode, I'm trying. It is called the Culture, Culture Philosophy Impacts. And essentially... He was thinking about uh, from previous episodes when we were rebuilding, sort of like what I did with the language first culture is sort of starting with the philosophy and then working outward. So just a different way to build cultures. It sounds interesting. I won't fight him over that one. <laughs> and as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting. World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.